So, just when I think I'm out, they pull me back in. That's right, it's time for another army painting video. And today, we're going to make it a little more challenging, because we're going to do this whole Iron Jaws army in yellow. Let's get after it. Uh, the strict technomancer that is Vinci V. Let us get into the technique and learn it Vinci V style. This is my co-host Tyler on Warhammer Weekly. He's a great dude and a great human being and a good friend. A long time ago I told him he should be playing Iron Jaws instead of the silly armies he is playing. He finally took my advice and really loved the army, but he doesn't own it. Now, I was recently given a chance to paint a whole Iron Jaws army for him, and how could I say no? So Tyler, this army's for you. I really hope you enjoy it, and I hope you get many big waz out of it. All right, so we're gonna start off with a uh, primer coat of Rot Brawn, which is just a red primer. If you don't have this, just coat them in black or whatever you've got, and then just spray some like whole red or some kind of deep red over it. It really doesn't need to be anything special. If you don't have an airbrush, you can just do this with a rattle can. No big deal at all. Uh, now, why am I using reds? Well, red is going to be a great setup for everything we're doing later. As I said, this army is going to be in yellow, and this red color is effectively going to act as our shadow color. So notice I'm really trying to make sure I get it in all the low spots. I want everything nice and covered, but especially from below. I'm also going to go ahead and shoot the base because this is going to lay down a sort of Martian earth base, which is what I want for later. Now, over the top of that, my first zenithal layer is light rust. And the light rust is just there to add some softer tones to it. It really has this like creamy milk chocolate sort of tone. And it acts as a great base for our next color, which is going to build again for the yellow. The battle with yellow is all in the undershading. If you don't have an airbrush, just jump straight to this step, which this is bone white or an ivory color. So if I didn't have an airbrush, I would do rattle can of some kind of red like that. There are many types of reds you can buy from the hardware store or anywhere. Then I would grab an off-white, like a warm off-white, and I would do the rattle can only from above. With the airbrush, however, it makes things a bit easier. Notice I'm not paying any attention to the weapon because those are gonna be metallic later, so they don't really matter. But here I am focusing just from above, and I'm doing this in multiple thin passes. I think a lot of times with our airbrush, we feel like, oh, we've got to do it all at once because I can. <laughs> You don't. We can do multiple thin passes and build up that color. Now here we have a mix of yellow ochre and orange ink from F.W. Dalla Rowney. The, orange, the drop of orange is to warm it up. Uh, and you notice I'm just hitting all that armor and look how bright and beautiful and intense. That is intensity in 10 cities, that yellow right there. Uh, now, ironically, the yellow plus orange mix is actually uh, has a decent opacity to it when applied through the airbrush. You'll see it here on that red. I don't want the red to be quite that strong, so I'm just kind of very carefully hitting it, but leaving that soft transition. But I'm just rocking that airbrush trigger slightly. And the idea here is I can go ahead, turn them all yellow, and all, so much of our base work is done, especially on things like these hard boys. We don't want to stop just there. So I've got a little dab of heavy body acrylic white. If you don't have the uh, a, a heavy body acrylic titanium white, any white will work. But we're gonna I'm gonna show you how to cheat at edge highlighting. Notice how much of this I'm taking off the brush. Basically, almost all of it. Look at how little shows up on my hand. But then we're gonna hit the model, and I turned the the brightness of my my lighting setup way down here because I really wanted you to be able to see those white edges when they stood out. Notice how when I run the brush over the edges, it's literally just catching the edges because I have to drag it over a line that actually catches the paint. This is what we call edge highlighting for free. None of it stays on the armor. None of this scratches over. It just hits the edges. And I'm making sure I just very carefully hit every one, light strokes, lots and lots and lots of passes. Notice how many passes I'm doing on this, right? I don't need to hit it all at once. But this is your secret to edge highlighting. If you work a soft makeup brush and work all the paint out, easy. Now, because I've used inks, it's quite, this, this whole paint job is quite satin. We need to mat it out. So we're gonna use a mix of one to three satin to ultra matte varnish. Satin for the thickness to protect it, ultra matte for the ultra matte. 
This also is very grippy as a varnish, so it's going to make future layers we do grip really well and will allow us to have sort of save points where if we make a mistake and paint goes where we don't want it, we can rub it off. So everybody gets a nice coat of varnish. Okay. All right. One more quick step. We're going to take a little bit of yellow white and just at the highest high points, I'm going to hit those just real quick and fast. Just boop, boop, little tiny boops. Just boop, like you're touching a little dog's nose, just to make sure those get bright. Now we got to do it to everybody else. So this is my fun time lapse footage. Start by turning everybody red, then light brown, then white. And you can see how that I am in fact painting a whole army, not one figure. I felt it was important. You might think I'm cheating otherwise. I mean, the series is called Hobby Cheating, so you don't know what I'm up to. But uh, as with all this stuff, the key is to take the steps that you know are going to be the largest sort of surface area and break them down into things that are simple and give you the most success. That's why I paid so much attention here to undershading because I wanted to make sure that when that yellow went on, because the yellow is the hard part, that it was going to be bright, clean, and beautiful with one quick, easy coat. No building up 50 layers, no nothing like that. We just get that yellow on there, and that fig is ready to go with the thing that's going to stand out the most. So take the time to set yourself up for success. That's the key, okay? Uh, gotta turn everybody yellow. And you can see, because of that shade, right, because of the, the gradation, that we used originally look at how wonderful those guys look out of the out of the rip not only do you have this bright yellow but it fades into this really natural warm deep orange yellow where the sort of red is showing through it's fantastic and all of that's basically free this took almost no time i mean getting all of these figs done this was seriously a couple of hours at most for for this base stuff and for things like the art boys so much of them is already done so much so that this is where I get a little cocky. And I'm like, well, if we're gonna do this army for a friend, we've gotta put some freehand on here, right? So I decided to do uh, dags on this one, I think is what orcs would call these, but little triangles. Uh, so we're just gonna put a bunch of little triangles on. Let's talk about the key to freehand in an army like this. Don't make it complicated, stick to a simple pattern and make it something where it's gonna break up the sort of flat surface you have. Because so much of these guys are yellow, it actually can get a little boring. Even once I pick out all the other elements, it'll be a bit overwhelming. By having a little bit of simple freehand in there, it breaks up that space. Now the mix I'm using for the freehand is quite simple. It's just some black paint with a drop of black ink and then a tiny drop of flow improver. If you don't have the flow improver or the black ink, you know, then use some extra water with your paint to get it thinned down, which you probably have to do a couple passes. The reason I like a little ink is because the ink makes the paint flow better while also increasing the pigment. And the little drop of flow improver really makes these lines sharp and easy. You see how I'm basically doing one pass and getting great coverage. This is AK Interactive Rubber Black, by the way, which I really like. It's kind of a slightly softer gray black. It's not hard, uh, true black, I guess. I don't know. It, it works well here. Uh, and I just, I never constrain myself with these kind of patterns as to exactly where they need to be. Over the course of the army, one of the great parts about doing orcs in general is that they can kind of be wherever. So some have it on just their hands or their hands and their shoulders or on leg plates or kind of wherever I felt like it, whatever I felt the model needed that kind of visual interest, right? Now comes a really interesting step. Mixed into these guys are some these little tiny pockets of other elements like here They have these little bits of chain and armor and then it goes up to flesh and things like that And a lot of that get hit, got hit very significantly by the yellow or by the white And so the separation line between those things isn't quite as strong as I would like So just very quickly I'm taking the same black cement black mix that I just did the freehand with and on critical areas where there's a hard separation of elements painting in a line that's going to help us achieve that light, dark, light. Okay, with that down, it's time to paint the rest of the model. And we're going to do, get out our old friend Contrast and keep this simple. 
So some Wildwood is our friend here uh, to do all the leather stuff. I like Wildwood. It's a nice, deep brown, black leather. It's great for the wood, for, uh, you know, basically anything I need it to be where I need to sort of darken it. And I'm not going to honestly put much other effort into it. I'm just going to rely on whatever Zenithal I already did to keep it visually interesting. Uh, as usual, I can't go a whole video and stay on camera. Let's not be crazy. Um, but because so like the, the, the spillover zenithal is there, the wildwood's gonna have a natural gradation. One coat, done, call it a day. Um, I did black out the rest of their elements that are eventually gonna be metallic as well. Now, because I'm using a bright color and their skin's gonna be green, we have to make the other elements neutral. So for their pants, I went for this nice gray color. Um, this is uh, light rubber, uh, or just tire rubber, I guess, from a or sorry, uh, from Secret Weapon. And then I just mixed a little bit of deck tan into it and created a quick highlight. Now I wanted to kind of talk through the other models in the army because some of the other models have interesting shapes and challenges. It's not all our boys, obviously. When it came to the beaten up armor of the Brutes, notice that the dry brushing, I went back over it there to make sure that it really lightly caught and brought out all those fun edges. I also changed the patterning some of my dags, putting it in the places that I thought would be visually interesting for the Brutes. Same with the pigs and so on, right? My point is when you're doing something like little freehand patterns, don't get addicted to placement. It's the presence that matters, not the placement. So put it where it's visually interesting for that model. Here you can see again, to keep it consistent, their pants are in that same gray, just doing a quick highlight there on it. Again, just mixing a little white into the gray, boom, done. And, and we're, we're happy with that nice little, so there's some contrast there, but we don't need to build too high on a part that's really not important to the overall visual impact of the model. We've got to hit all these little I don't know what they are, wraps, straps. I hate straps on models, I really do. So here we've got uh, a little bit of a mix of deck tan and wildwood, and I'm just giving them a nice quick coat. I'm gonna rely on the deep shadows later. Uh, you'll see how we get to deep shadows in just a few moments. But I kind of do a nice mix there uh, of, of the wildwood plus the deck tan. I'm minimizing my palette. Work with as few paints as you can when speed painting. Just rely on mixing two things together. Hey, I need a white brown. Cool, I grab the deck tan, throw it in the brown. I need a white gray. Grab some deck tan, throw it in the gray. Now I take that same deck tan, and I'm just gonna create some, again, some contrast, some edges on there. Just hit basically the edges of the, the straps. Make sure that they stand out, have a little bit of highlight to them, stuff like that. Um, again, just keeping it visually interesting and making sure that they show and read as straps with lots of light, dark light. For the big fur on the Gorgruntas, of which there are six, yet again, we're going back to our old friend Wildwood, and we're just going to get a nice heavy coat of that all over the fur. Again, over the natural gradation that was created earlier, that's already going to create some contrast, but you'll see how we're going to buff it up in just a moment. I grabbed a big, ugly brush and just slapped that paint on, just get, just getting swifty with it. Then I grabbed a flesh tone, just a nice medium flesh tone that I had there. And I just do a very light sort of pseudo dry brush, but really I'm just taking, it's more of a little wet brush across the tips of the fur. And you can see how that makes it feel very natural. End of day two, everything's looking good. We've made a ton of progress. All of the base stuff is down except this skin. We've got everything shaded highlighted all of that, except we don't have those nice, deep, dark recesses. So now it's time to ruin the project. That means it's time for grime. So before the next step, we're gonna varnish again, same ratio as before, one satin, two, three, ultra matte. We're gonna, normally people use streaking grime, we're gonna use Starship streaking grime. It's a slightly more green influenced color, it's a little more green brown, as you can see from its color there, I really like it. It's gonna work a lot better in this yellow. So we basically just spray the model down. Again, if you don't have a airbrush, you can just brush this on. Uh, make sure you get it from below. All of those low areas need to be well coated. 
please wear a mask when you're doing this, a respirator, run a fan. It is extremely, extremely toxic. Now we've got a mix of makeup brushes, both big wedges, sponges like that, as well as tiny little uh, sponges. We've got our Gamblin Gamsol white spirits, but any white spirits will do, but I like Gamsol or Mona Lisa. We wait until the model looks dry, i.e. it no longer looks wet and glossy. And then we're just gonna take that makeup sponge and we are gonna go to town. Now we have multiple settings we can do here. The first setting that we get to, and maybe I'll do a whole video on this sometime, is called Ultra Grim Dark. Uh, and that's where you just use the makeup brush and kind of give it a good wipe in the, the key areas and leave everything else brown and gross and gritty. If you're looking for ultra grim dark, there is no better setting than this right here. You can see how everything gets influenced by that brown and just becomes really nice and deep and gross. Uh, because you can't get into all the shapes with the makeup brush, you then grab your little tiny brushes uh, if you're skinny, then use your little brushes and then you get those in there and that can help you get all the rest of the areas like that are stuck in between. However, we're going to go a little cleaner than ultra grim dark. We do still, we did a lot of work on that yellow, so we want it to be bright. So we're going to get a little pipette of our white spirits and we're going to put one drop onto one side of our tiny sponge. So one side has white spirits, one side does not. Look at how much more yellow that is once I just touch that there. And then I use the dry side to wipe down. Now, an important part about the use of streaking grime, always be moving the brush in the direction you want the streaks to travel. It leaves the impression of subtle streaks. So when I move the brush, I'm usually moving it at an angle down and back, right? Because that's where I want the streaks to travel. And notice how I alternate between the wet side of the brush and the dry side. And this is the waste. That's everything after I'm all done. They're all cleaned up and now it's time for the final details. So first off, the little bones, uh, which is just doing some quick striations of deck tan. Again, sticking to those same colors. I did wild with them all out, so they were brown. And then I just do some quick streaks, some quick little striations. I have a whole video on bone striations. You can see that linked in the top corner now. But those look great. Then we do the skin. Now the skin is a fun mixture of uh, three to one uh, orc flesh contrast paint with the same yellow ink from the armor. The regular orc flesh contrast paint is way too green, but that dollar rowney yellow ink, yellow ochre is so intense that it just yellows it right out, especially when combined with our already warm tones underneath. And you can see how there, when it dries, look at how much difference it looks when it dries. Then we're gonna, but we need to make these more visually interesting. We can do more than just a layer of contrast. So I grab some uh, orcish dermish, dermis, sorry, from scale 75, which is basically a pink color. You just need like a soft pink color. And I'm gonna work some pink into the knuckles, the lips, the nose, around the eyes, all of those areas that make the thing seem more alive. And because the pink works as such an excellent contrasting color to the green, it just provides a ton of visual interest. Now a note, if you actually use this Orcish Dermis from Scale 75, when it first goes on, it looks really intense and really pink. When it dries, it actually softens quite a bit. Next up, it's time to scuff up this armor. We're gonna use some sponge weathering here. I have these little sponge sticks from Green Stuff World. I decided to give them a try. I don't love them. But any, basically take any kind of little sponge. If you have little clamshell sponges, those are actually perfect from like the old school clamshells. You can just tear those into pieces and use those, but any nylon sponge like that'll work. I'm using Rhinox Hide. I just grab a little, wipe almost all of it off. So much that there barely looks like there's any on there. And then you just lightly and repeatedly dab the model. So you get little tiny dots all over it that looks very organic and natural. All right, it's the end of day three, and unfortunately, tragedy struck. Uh, we've made really great progress, but this morning uh, I wrenched my back real bad, and so it was basically extreme pain to sit and paint. I still managed to get about eight hours in. We just we've, we medicated and fought our way through the pain, but I did not get as much done as I hoped. That being said, everything is done except the metallics. Uh, so I feel really good about where we're at. Uh, these guys are all coming together awesomely, and uh, so it's going to be day four, and hopefully we'll finish these bad boys up. So let's get over to those metallics. 
narrator, he did not finish in time. The metallics took forever. This is about two days of work. I was still recovering, but I'll take you through it because in the end, the metallics always are one of the longer parts of the project. We begin with laying down a big, wet amount of uh, Vallejo metal color, uh, uh, sorry, Vallejo metal color gun metal mixed with our black, the same black we've been using for everything else. This is going to be our dark color. And I lay it on thick so we can use our old friend wet blending. Then I grab gunmetal base, start working it into places where I want the highlights. Just kind of laying it in there, mixing it with the still wet paint, working that wet on wet. One of the great parts about Vallejo metal color when you lay it on thick is it will stay wet for a little while. Then I go up to pale burnt metal and I work that into the wet on wet. Then I wipe my brush a whole bunch and just blend it together. And you can see how then we get these natural organic movements between the different metals, right? It just easily blends into each other where we grab them and they all become one harmonious metal without any hard edges separating them. Uh, you can of course reinforce them. If you wet blend too much, you can go back in, put in a little dab, wipe it off and then feather it more. And that's in fact what I do right here on the edge. The other important part we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure that we get that, the sort of copper color down. This is a mix of three drops copper Vallejo metal color to one drop gold to two drops of flow improver and one 128th of green stuff world's copper pigment. So enjoy that. Uh, you, people love recipes. Uh, as with all metals, we want to make sure we get a nice solid edge on there. We use the lessons of non-metallic metal. So I am tracing all the appropriate edges, edge highlighting the metals uh, as per you know, what we would expect. I do both the copper and the silver with those edge highlights. And then once the brush is almost empty, I add a little bit of highlights to the copper as well. Now taking a mix of Rhinox Hide, again, same color I've been using with a little bit of the black, same color I've been using. I just dab some around into the head of the ax to create some interesting brown tones, old worn weathered, pseudo rusty. I put down some relatively reasonable dabs of paint, not very thin, and then I take a watery brush and I just feather it out over the entire ax head, uh, the non-blade parts. The blades, I assume he hits people pretty often, so those stay fresh and clean. Now I'm taking a sharp brush and some of the pale burnt metal and just making little hashes into the end. You need to make these really, really thin, but it has a great look as though this ax chops repeatedly. Last step is to weather out these the, the copper. So we grab our old friend Nilic Oxide. I do have a larger video on Verdigree. You can find that linked up in the top. But we're gonna keep it simple for this army painting project. So we're just keeping it with the Nilic Oxide. The important part is we focus it around like the bolts and stuff like that, because that's where the water is gonna collate. So that's where the oxidation happens. Uh, next up, we've gotta go ahead and get the bases ready to go. So we're going to do a little dry brushing on the bases here. Uh, we're gonna make sure we're just using a nice medium flesh tone and we're gonna just go ahead and dry brush that all out. With that, we grab a little mix of red and brown ink and we're just gonna do a nice pass over the whole base, uh, making sure that seeps down into there, gives us some nice variation. We're using the base mix, the primer, plus some of the leftover streaking grime. We've already created some color variants. That plus the dry brushing, we're gonna have something visually interesting. Our final step though, we're gonna grab some nice bright iron oxide pigment, and we're just gonna scatter that around the base, make sure that we have those bright red spots, things look dusty, kind of like a bit of a, a rough iron infused Martian-like setting, which I think is just a really great base. It's desaturated, but it sets off the, the green skin of the orc really nicely. Uh, it's all in that harmonious color palette of the red, yellow, and green. Then that last step, ooh, that sweet moment when you get to black rim that base. Mm, mm, yeah, let's zoom in there real close. Yeah, that's it. That sweet, sweet final step. Mm, so good. Yeah, so that's the last step, of course. You can paint your base rims any color as long as it's black. All right, so there we go. We're all done. It took longer than I thought. Ended up taking about five days, but we've got the army for Tyler. I couldn't be more excited. 
you're gonna see some shots of this coming up so you can see what we did in the five days but i'll tell you right now i am just happy to be done with all of this this was a Oh, so you'll have to come back next week to learn how we did the big maw crushes as we talk about giant monsters next week. But I do hope you enjoyed this. This was a really fun army to do. It took five days all in all, and I think it was really worth it. I think it came out looking cool and grim and very much ready for a wah. If you liked this, give it a like, subscribe for additional hobby cheating in the future, and as always, we'll see you next time.